Okay, just finishing finishing up my diet drive. You see, it's not the individual people here whom I attack. There was this spirit of the age, right, which tells people that all their problems are going to be solved by a programming language. Right? This is not a new idea. This is an idea which has been around for a long time. That if people say, oh, I'll go and invent a programming language, and I call it after my favorite girlfriend. And that will solve problems. And, you know, I'm this, belong to small but still existing group of people, says it is not about programming languages. It is about algorithms and data structures. That's my mantra. You can believe it. You could sort of say, no, he's wrong. We will listen to, you know, Haskell guys or Java guys or object-oriented guys or functional programming guys. Okay? I'm a Knuth guy. So this is what I'm trying to convince you. I mean, you know, I'm, it's a free country, well, of sorts. Uh, <laughs> therefore, at least, you know, I behave as if it were a free country. Uh, therefore, I could say what I believe. And I believe that algorithms are important, data structures are important. It's important to know them. And languages, it's something which usually prevents us from implementing correct algorithms and data structures. So the best language, from my point of view, is the language which does the least. And those of you who are familiar with my style of programming in C++, you know, obviously I use, what, one-tenth of one percent of C++. I mean, all the C++ which I use could be described on 10 pages. All of C++ cannot be described on 10 pages. And it has been. It, well, actually, it has been. Sean Parent, remember Sean Parent, the guy who, who gave a talk here, uh, together with Bjarna, formalized this subset of C++, which Paul and I think should be used. And he actually even wrote a parser for it. So you could. There's the, an appendix at the end of Elements of Programming that basically describes that subset of C++. Element of Programming is a great book which all of you should aspire to read before you die. Paul and I wrote it. I have to, you know, and those of you who want it could get a free copy signed by the authors. Amen. We have been giving them away, but nobody wants them. Certainly. There are more available, yes. There are more available. First come, first serve. First um, come, first serve. So to go back to something uh, that... This uh, is, by the way, this is a series of... Uh, Offer. I mean, we, you know, I still have more copies. I'll be happy to give them away, and both Paul and I will be happy to sign. But um, you have to ask. Uh, to go back to something John said about, you know, say you do need a list, and you do need uh, reliable performance, and you don't control your memory allocator. What do you do? You can write your own list, as in, well, you can write your own memory allocator. And, and implement a list-like thing on top of it. If, if, you've, if you were here for Alex's last course, where we did uh, this list pool to do uh, least um, highest two elements or min two elements, something like that, it, 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 was, it was quite remarkable. I mean, I think it's worth going back and looking at that code, or those lectures are on YouTube, you can look at that. But you can very easily implement a list-like thing inside a vector, and then that gives you much stronger guarantees about where it's going to be, how it's going to be allocated. And of course, you are doing it for your application. So this is not a generic allocator, which would be really complicated. This can be really simple, because you know that my application just does these things. I don't have to write a generic allocator. I just need these two types of objects, or just this one type of object. And I don't need, you know, maybe I can just drop the entire vector when I'm done with it. You know, it's sort of like an arena deallocation. So there are, there are cases where you should consider that approach. Okay, so now we are rapidly getting, well, <clears throat> we will soon enter the territory where there will be a lot of data and no good explanations for why it is the way it is. So you have to remember what Alex said at the beginning of the class, which is we have to look at the data, 
the machines are really complicated and there comes a point where you can theorize about what it may be doing but really, I mean there, there are lots of things that, that we will not know. So let, let, let's see. Let, before, uh, but there will be many things we will <clears throat> know. Uh, so, the, yeah. Okay, this is just another uh, set and uh, hash related benchmark I want to show which is here we are doing the same similar things with you know, we create a vector, a set and a hash of different sizes and then we iterate over <coughs> the elements of the, well, using the array that we use to cr create these data structures, we find each element in them. So here we do a binary search, here we, you know, do call set.find, then we call hash.find and then what's in this table uh, is average uh, lookup time per element. Okay. So if you are actually using an associative data structure for lookup instead of iteration, this is what you get. Okay. So let's start at the top. Um, surprisingly, well, this is behaving differently from before, but you can see that uh, <laughs> The set is very competitive with binary search when we start because, you know, they're both basically doing about the same number of operations, the same number of comparisons. And you can see the hash has a fixed overhead of the hash function, so, you know, it, it, it's a little costlier. Now, as the size of the data increases. The set is perhaps entirely inside the cache. Yes, at this point, everything is entirely inside the level one uh, data cache. And as we go bigger, this is probably the phase where we are in the level two cache, but no longer in the level one cache, right? So you can see that uh, if you were to graph this, the set will become bad much faster. Although they're still not, I mean, as long as you're in L2, it's still not that bad, right? Um, and at this point, the hash starts to uh, be very respectable because, you know, if you're missing your L1, you know, one miss is better than five misses. But as you go down, you see that as you go to main memory, both binary search and the set perform really badly, right? Whereas the hash is still pretty good. And again, it's like this is, we, we've been talking about node-based data, data structures are bad, right? This is not a node-based data structure. This is an array, <coughs> Co completely dense, and we're doing binary search on it, right? Why is this bad? still log in as opposed to constant. That's one thing, but really, what are we doing when we do binary search? We are doing random access. So we say, okay, what is the middle of this thing? Let's read it. Then we figure out either we go this way or we go that way. So in the case of a set, we read the value of a pointer and follow it. In this case, we compute the value of a pointer and follow it, but it's still very similar. It's just, are you getting the value? I mean, there are some advantages to computing the value of, well, whatever. We are reading, we are actually not totally computing it, right? We are reading the value at that location, and then based on that, we are calculating something. So it's still a data dependency. So in both of these cases, you, you have the same dereferencing-like behavior, which gives you this performance. Yeah. So <laughs> would it maybe be advantageous if you have a large data structure, say, an array, you have like a two-level, binary lookup, where first you have a very small data structure and you search for a rough boundary and then you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a simple answer, yes. Wouldn't that be interesting to measure? Yes. And implement, yes. Would be Why don't you? Again, don't forget, you know, we're here to inspire you, not to do all the work you want us. Yes? Yes, to, you know, yes, it's, you're correct, and yes, somebody needs to, to build such things. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Google guys produced a, a B-tree-like data structure for in-memory. B-tree was not designed for in-memory, designed for disks, but they sort of used it for in-memory things, and if you think about B-tree, it sort of collocates a bunch of pointers so you could do do a local search and it speeds things up considerably and uh, you know whatever they did could be could be done much better so you, you, you get a tree that is much shallower 
and you know, the cache is going to cache the entire cache line anyway. So you might as well take advantage of yes, that. So there absolutely. are very many things which can be done. The sad fact that they are not done. But yes, you are correct. You are correct. Uh, observe also sort of the, the amazing thing which you could always do. I see invariably that when people use set, and let's assume that for whatever reason you need to, to do ordering, but invariably what they do, they construct a set first and then access it. This could be factor of three. If you take this set, copy it into a vector, which will give you a sorted vector. You will speed up things by a factor of three. It's not two orders of magnitude, but you know, factor of three might matter. Plus, the memory footprint is going to be dramatically, dramatically better. Yes? Uh, is this including on each no. No. Only lookups. These are just finds. Yes. These are very simple, I mean, these are sort of, let's measure one thing. We measured iteration through, we measured here, finds. And what we're using here is a flat, flat set data structure that's in boost. Um, it, it, interesting tidbit, we created this initially by, uh, you know, we had a vector and we say, okay, create this flat set from this vector. And the interface documents this as being an end login operation, but I can assure you it was not. Uh, so when you use the library, I mean, it's, it's a great library. They've implemented a flat uh, array-based container-like structure, very good, but you have to be aware the, of, you know, constructing it from a range, you, you should sort the range and then call a specific constructor that takes a sorted range. Otherwise, this is going to be quite quadratic. It, this takes a very long time. So Again, going back to the question of everything, measure. Even if it comes from boost, even if it comes from your vendor, measure it. Even if it's in the standard library, there measure could be problems. It. There are often problems. Yes. If you find one, just fix it. You know, it's not easy to do. It's not hard to do. All right, now we get to the real uh, uh, hard to understand. Why does set have, uh, why, why is the timing for set more than the binary set? And they are they're both behaving as if they are far apart. Right? The jumping will be similar. It's bigger. Less of it fits in the cache. So footprint we, is much, much larger here. Let's imagine that you are dealing with integers, right? even 64-bit integers. Here, if you have, whatever, a million integers, this is about a million, right? You're going to have a memory footprint of what? Eight million bytes, yes? But here, your memory footprint is going to be one integer, three pointers, and something else, four times as large. So more stuff, more often, you're going to miss the cache, right? Sorry, right? Yeah. I mean, in particular, what happens with trees, you end up having the top few layers in cache, and then after that, you're out of cache. So you know, the faster you get out of that layer, you're in trouble. All right. So, so far, we've been measuring memory operations, and we haven't really measured you know, there's lo lots of other things in CPU. You add, subtract, multiply. We haven't measured any of those primitives, right? So next, we are going to measure those primitives. And, uh, let's show you a snippet of what we are actually going to run. Okay, so we have a bunch of small function objects. So we have plus, which just says x plus y, right? Uh, multiply x multiplied by y. Divide is actually a condition followed by divide, so check that y is not 0, and then you divide. Um, f plus, which is just like plus, except it's not inlined. So we can see the cost of a function call. Uh, this is a min operation, <coughs> return the least of x and y. This will tell us we how- We don't it, use it. We don't, I think, oh, we took it out. Okay, never mind. Um, 
Euclidean norm. So this is x square plus y square. So this is two multiplications followed by an addition. Conversion. So what this does is it takes two numbers, converts them to double, and then adds them. And then converts them converts back them from double back. to whatever. So if it's integer, say t is integer, integer to two, convert to double, convert to double, convert back to integer to two. So the same plus, we're doing just plus, but we're going through, and people often say, I'll go to the largest type, I'll convert everything to double. Which is a natural thing in C, because that's the C's philosophy. When you do the computation, convert everything to double, right? Does it automatically for you? <laughs> I mean, that yes. was C way of genericity. Mm -hmm. Convert everything to the. And finally, we have square root, where we add x and y, take the absolute value, calculate the square root, and power, where we take the absolute value of x plus y and raise it to the We're computing one by cube three, root. Cube root, using the power function. Because the library does not provide cube root. So we go, and you say people never do it. You would be surprised, even in the search engine, there were multiple uses of power. And let us, yes? So y square root is a way to take x and y and you plus this y I could explain that, because we want to, all of these kernels to have common structure. You have two loads, computation followed by store. In the right. overall approaches, we have two vectors with a bunch of numbers. We and apply what, these operations on the pair, write it into the third one. So it's just different computational kernels, but the, the structure of the thing is always read x, read y, do the computation, store it in z. Right? So that's why the, all the, you know. And while well, being honest, Obviously, as we shall see, the cost of plus does not play any role in all of that. So you say, well, but wouldn't it be faster? Simple answer, no, <laughs> as we shall see. This is, this is a good question, but you know, let, us, let us see what happens. Yeah, I mean, we are measuring plus separately, so we can look at that. Uh, and the main loop here is there are three uh, sequences, S1, S2, and S3, right? We call standard transform, which takes an operator, uh, well, the, the by, function object. The by, um, by binary function version of standard transform, which takes a function object and two sequences. So it has S1 begin, S1 end, S2 begin, applies the function object and stores it in this uh, output iterator, right? And we do it, um, each sequence is pretty short. Uh, right now, I think it's a thousand elements, which fits in the level one cache. So there are no memory effects here. And we repeat the whole thing some number of times, I think like uh, um, 10,000 or something. Right? And we do it. Enough times to eliminate time of variability, actually. We, we want to have st stable results. They don't change from run to run. And we're going to do it for these six types. Integers of these four sizes, float, double. Plus, we're going to use it for three types of sequences. That's so what we vary is type, the data structure where type resides, and the operation which we do on the type, right? But the thing is very simple. Take two things from the data structure, bring them up, combine them with whatever function, and store them. But we could vary data structures. So the three data structures are vector, of course, DEC, and list. So list is a standard uh, double E link, link list. DEC is, you know, you can think of it as a bunch of vectors in a link list. Right? So you have, uh, I think, each, whatever it's called, tablet or something is, 
256 entries. And so you, when you're iterating over it, what you do is, am I at the end of the current section? If so, I jump to the next one. Otherwise, they're called segments. Segments. If I'm at the end of the segment, I need to follow a link to the get to the to get to the next segment. Otherwise, it's just like a vector. It's a dense, um, densely allocated. And set plus segments. plus, it's just a conditional. And hopefully, you know, you usually the conditional is not taken. So processor should always go there. Let's see if any of that is true. By the way, those of you who are interested in C++, this is a good way, if you read the source, to learn how to use template template functions. Observe what we do there. Let's go back. Yes. We're passing. This is not a type. This is a template. We're passing template to a template, OK? And only evil people like us do that. <laughs> so uh, you, you actually should not normally do that, but it's actually quite pretty. But you can look at the source code for details. I'm not going to explain that. No. This is not, yeah. this is not in that subset that Alex was talking about. No. But you can do it. Well, the dozen people who know how to do it can do it, yes. Yes, half a dozen. Which now includes all of you, so. All right, so this has a lot of data in it, so we'll spend some time looking at it. Um, okay, so let's start here, right? We, okay, let, let me explain the table, I guess. These are the operations I described. Plus, plus with a function call, multiply, x squared plus y squared, Convert to float and add. Divide square root power. And all of the measurements are nanoseconds per operation. Average over, you know, except 100,000. These are, I don't even have a word, picoseconds. <laughs> so yeah, let's first just look at these numbers, because these are really peculiar. No. This is all in the L1, yes. Okay. Intentionally. You'll still see some, uh, we'll get to it. We'll see the effect of following a pointer, but it's no, there are no cache missing. Okay, so if we start with uh, the vector uh, plus, right? We're done. It's, the first thing to notice is it's really fast. So point that's zero an four. understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Think about what it says there. It says that we could read two things from memory, add them together, e increment a couple of three pointers, store it. Well, store it, then increment it. Do conditional to check whether we reach to the end. And it all takes 0.04 nanoseconds. And this computer, by the way, is a 2.6 gigahertz processor. So the clock speed here is a third of a nanosecond approximately, right? just under 0.4. So what this number is telling us is that in each, it, less than that, it, I mean, the throughput is uh, like eight, eight iterations oh, it's about per two, two cycle, of which is completely unbelievable. Like, how can that be? I mean, I, ha I have no explanation. I'm just. Yes, but never. I mean, let us count operations which we do per cycle. We need to do two loads. Everybody agrees? Well, first we, we need to, to compute two, two addresses. First, we need to compute two addresses. Well, supposedly, <laughs> let us assume that we're dealing with pointers, that there are no indexing, as it is in the case. We're just incrementing pointers? We're just incrementing Fine. pointers. Okay. This, this is just vector. Let us assume that everything is stripped. We're dealing with pointers. Let's it, it, not It's the same both ways. It. Yes, yes, yes. So we need to do two loads. We need to get the data. We need to do store. Do you agree? Then we need to do the following thing. We need to add somehow 
doesn't matter. We need to add the data which we are reading, this int eight quantities. Then, remember, we need to increment the pointers. That's how all that's three how of them. Go. All three of them, right? Two source and one destination. Seven. But then, don't forget, we need to do a compare, right? Otherwise, we'll be doing all kind of terrible things. I mean, you know, you have to terminate. Are we at the end of our vector? So one comparison. Right? You have to have one compar comparison in branch. But, you know, all of the eight, nine instructions. Yes, we do know, let's assume all of us understand, that you could issue multiple instructions, that you could pipeline. But it's still eight, eight things we need to do, and we do them. I mean, the, the result is correct. So here, what, what it shows that sort of the, the important thing to do is to look there and to look there, right? Sort of we're talking enormous, I mean, three orders of magnitude between doing simple computation for a highly optimized data structure. Right? Yes, obviously, we all know that Intel could issue multiple operations, up to four, I believe, yes? But it still does not, exp I mean, nothing explains the numbers which, I mean, which, which we get. So, and obviously, this Intel microarchitecture does some amazing transformations there. I mean, the claim is that what is effectively running there is VLIW process. I mean, that Intel takes the I, I32 instructions. At some point, stream. someone has to recognize that these are eight eight bit ads, and we can do them using one 64 bit adder or something. Because otherwise, something, there's no way you can that's do this. Not, it's not simple because you need to wrap around bits. What yeah. I mean, I do not know what is going on. We could find out. By the way, for all, there are so many mysteries in this state. You've only looked at the first six <laughs> numbers so far, right? Uh, the other thing, you look at multiply. There used to be a time when multiply was significantly more expensive than add. And people used to say, oh, let's do strength reduction, right? Um, it's not that different. I mean, if you look at doubles, for example, Yes, that is so an interesting, interesting thing. What about? <laughs> you are the manager. You have to know. Managers know everything. You and Vinay, or and Mr. Dubinsky at the back, who is a director, he should know everything. We don't know. Again, with enough work, all of these numbers could be explained. But. I don't have the time, but I'm has a real job, you know, has to talk to people like voice and whatever. Right? So we cannot, but before we explain, remember how I started saying that we don't have to understand everything, but it's Im imperative that we know. Right? And by the way, these are very stable. We have run the benchmark lots of times. One different in different settings. And indeed, in 16 is faster. We have no idea why. So, who knows? So, for all intents and purposes, we multiply 2%. And I mean, in, in, in fact. That is a good approximation, especially in many respects. That's a very important line, vector of double. Because I suspect that that's, that's what people do, the real people, physicists. They take vectors of depth and do stuff with them. Yes. Multiply them, you know, for sure do norm and things like that. Right? But observe this amazing thing, for example, times versus norm. Times has how many multiplication? One. Norm has two plus addition. There's Not no much practical difference. difference. It's I mean at worst it's one multiplication plus one addition. Yes. With list, we will see there are lots of weird things in the list. Things that yeah. do not let us not mm. jump to conclusions. I mean, this thing, by the way, you should print it, put it by the side of bedside, and when you go to bed, meditate on that. 
<laughs> Let it permeate your mind. And then you will ascend to the next level. I, it's a very profound table because it tells us about all kinds of things. Or division, for instance, which is 7 for int 8 and 16, but for some reason 2.7 for int 32. But there is a bizarre thing. Look here. If we put the same 8-bit int in a more complicated data structure, it starts running twice as fast. Could I explain that? No. Well, not now. Right? Don't forget, remember what we said. What we have is three level of highly competent idiots doing all they can. Sort of one level of idiots are people who design the processor and do all kind of magic. Then we have another level of very intelligent idiots designing compiler. Uh, compiler. And then we have a level of idiots designing these data structures. That was me. So the interaction between these levels, who knows? I mean, there are things which happen. And for instance, the, the eight bit division. OK, so division is much more expensive than multiplication. That is still true. But much more expensive again. It's not much more 70 expensive. Times. It's, <laughs> it's so much more expensive that it's just enormously. Integer division. Observe the remarkable thing that the fastest way to divide is float, and it's by a lot. Integer division, and you heard me saying that, you know, is very bad. The only thing which is worse is the remainder. Well, it's related. And there is absolutely no evidence that Intel guys take it seriously. This is the problem which remains. It's clear that they know how to make it faster. How, how is it clear? Why is it provable from that? And they do it in doubles. And doubles, the mantissa is longer than, say, in 32, right? Well, certainly so, in 8. <laughs> or for sure, it's longer than even in 32. So they should be able to use the same circuitry to do division? Apparently not. Of course, there is even enormous, enormous discrepancy with float. But they cannot, somehow, Intel management does not care about integer division. You know, they think that if you want to divide by three, you know, Two orders of magnitude. No, you know. And the big difference between int 8, int 16, and then int 32 clearly shows that int 8 and int 16 are just, we've never seen this in our code that we are testing with a processor. We are not going to optimize it. It's probably, it's, you know, never looked at. Nobody cares. But if you look at, this is, you know, at least but respectable. But actually, they cannot. Look, these are people who, who, as we well know, managed to get the division not just slow, but wrong. And I'm not. You know, I'm not blaming it. These are very complicated things. And, you know, testing, you know, customers will probably never notice. You know, what's, you know, once in a while you get wrong results. And customers indeed did not notice for, for a while. And I don't know whether you remember the story, the original reaction for Intel was, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it actually does, but. Here, the performance, and nobody demands anything. Why? Because nobody measures. Intel could get away with these performance numbers because there is no outcry. People don't say, why if I divide 256 by 3, I have to wait, oh, about 300 times as long as necessary. I mean, it should, I mean, by the way, if you ever need to divide int 8, I'll tell you a very fast algorithm. Create a table. It's small enough. Table lookup will be considerably faster than what they do. It's not, it's not what, but somehow Intel doesn't care. Right. In division. Is it faster to convert to double and then do the division and convert back? Look. We see how Conversion long is. it takes to convert. We tested that right here. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, but you, 
again, it's very simple. You add these two columns. Is, is it though? Because yeah. you demonstrated that actually multiplying twice and adding is sometimes faster than just multiplying. No, no, no. It gives you an approximation. We will see that it's nothing. Adding things is clearly a wrong way of predicting things. But it's a relatively good way of estimating things. So it does look like it's a Yeah, it will be faster. No question about it. No question about it. Yes? F plus is do plus through a function, function call. Uh, non in line. Do not in line plus. Just the, it's exactly the same as this, but there is a function call. And you see what happens? 20, 30 times easy. That's the cost of a function call. It doesn't mean that you should inline everything. But little things, or things like which that. you do often, yeah. you could have enormous penalty. So whatever magic is Remember, making this go really it fast and put it is defeated when you do a function call. Okay. Now, let, okay. square root. <laughs> but that, do you see what is so very surprising? Yes. Well, and not just faster than division, it is amazingly fast. I mean, 3.86 is good. Well, by the way, why square root is good? Because we do not do square root on these types. We always go through double. And that is an optimized path. So Intel put an effort into doing square root. We clearly get very respectable things for square root. But if per chance you need a cube root, be prepared. So using trigonometric functions, very slow. I'm, by the way, I'm not criticizing the implementation. I have no, I, first of all, I don't know where Pau comes, whether it comes from uh, GNU, whether it comes from Intel. You know, I haven't traced the, the origin of the code. Uh, but beware in terms of if you use one, one, one of this, you're going to be, oh, so much slower. Your code might drop by two, three orders of magnitude compared with simple arithmetic. If you could avoid using these guys, do. I mean, in inner loops for big data, I mean, these are, these are the situations. Now, what else do we see? We see, let us go now down. What do we observe? One simple observation is when we look at plus for a vector, there is enormous variation. Do you see enormous variation? We go to deck. It jumps, it jumps tremendously. What disappears? The variation is gone. You would think, you see? These, these are steady. It's the Practically same Practically no variation at flat. all. Right? Right? So you would think that what we're doing, we're doing the same thing, but we delayed something. There should be additive factor. There should be complexity of accessing the deck plus the complexity of operation, yes? Complexity of the operation. Small. No, but it's still, I mean, the difference is something but like 0.2. But there was measurable difference. I mean, we don't see anything like that difference over here. Yeah, but it's just not the long pole, so it doesn't matter. That, okay, so what do you mean by that? What do you mean it's not the long pole? Whatever, whatever the overhead with the deck is, it's doing the operation essentially in parallel, so it doesn't matter. That is the point, that very often when you do this and that, instead of if you read Knuth, in the very beginning of volume one, if we ever get a chance to study it, there is at least one person who was here, two people here who are supporting it, uh, we will see how Knuth measures complexity. He says we have these successive operations, we have to add them together. Well, we don't have to add them together. The function is actually a max function. So if you say do this and this, 
Very often, instead of adding, the correct metric is max. Right? So since the excess time becomes the dominant factor, it eats everything else is done in the background in parallel. Right? And you say, well, it's just for plus. No. Things, even if we look at deck for convert, it's pretty flat except when there is a significant difference because double does not convert at all. It's no op. So there we sort of really see, because we know that just do nothing takes roughly 1.1 that time. Looks like it's cheaper to convert float to double than to convert double. But, <laughs> uh, yes, it does. But, but <laughs> it, it isn't. It's in the, the, the other thing about the parallelization is that it tells you that tables of this nature, they may illuminate something, but do not take them very seriously. Because actually, the no, actual take cost. Them very seriously, but think. The actual cost of the operation is going to depend on what else you're doing at that time. Which data structure is your operation in? So if you have a micro benchmark that just says, oh, I'm going to iterate over this list and, or this uh, vector and do binary search and measure how long it takes me to do binary search, that is not going to be an accurate measurement of how long it takes me to do binary search. Because when you actually do a binary search, there will be something else before it, there will be something else after it. And so these kinds of numbers, while they can illuminate something, do not treat them, uh, I mean, take them with the appropriate grain of salt. So you're, you're moving a float around instead of a double before you do the conversion. So it's possible that it's smaller. Or, you know, there's it's some other smaller. expensive operation you're doing after, well, okay. But this, yeah. you, know, so, the, you know, when you see the difference of that order, just say, because. I mean, who will know, right? We're talking about, you know, 3%, under 3% difference. No, it's, it's clearly, you know, not visible, even if you fully understand the instructions, the microarchitecture. The difference of 3% just cannot, cannot be understood. It just, it just happens. Uh, pr m m most likely, it's not going to persist. This will change the architecture Even to the architecture. next shrink, when they shrink, the, the uh, might affect it. These, these are all very dependent. You know, if you buy Mac with 3 gigahertz, it does not exist, I believe. But when it exists, it might, it might you know, dramatically change these little things. By the way, and every time Intel comes with a new, truly new core design, it will affect a whole bunch of things. Will it affect them radically? No. That is, you should take them very seriously, meaning no matter what happens, function call will be bad. Will it be bad by that much? Maybe yes, maybe no. Unless you're calling the power function, in which case it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but function call for little things is bad, right? So if you have to think this is the problem with, you know, some people say, oh, I'll make everything virtual. <laughs> so you make your f plus virtual. Never mind that it's virtual. It's just the fact that it's function call is going to change it from this to this. So if you remember yes. our sort benchmark. I have a question. So, doesn't compiler optimize uh, this small function to inline? Obviously not, because we put a pragma no in line. Yes? But compilers do, but let us see what happens if they don't. They do not for sure if you use virtuals. Or if you design your interface yes? wrongly. For instance, if your sort function takes a pointer to a function as your comparator, like the C library QSort function, right? Why is the QSort function slower than QuickSort? These are the same algorithms, right? Because this is doing a function call. There are some other things. There are other things, but you know, the algorithm is a little better, but it's not, those no, other no, things don't explain. the interface is much better because the other thing also needs to pass the length of the element explicitly at runtime. Uh, I mean, there are 
other things. There are things. other things in the interface as well. Absolutely. But right. I suspect a big chunk of it is probably yes, the that, function Yes, that. Yes. There's another problem with function calls, which is not only the overhead of calling the function, but if the compiler can't see inside the function, that prevents a lot of optimizations where it, could, it has to consider worst case possibilities on what you might be doing. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So you should but consider whole program here, optimization. You should consider link time optimization. Could, could we go back to our? Yes, we could. Uh, the significant thing, here compiler knows everything. We just force it to do a function call. Nothing it could do. So again, we're not trying, we're, we're not trying to see, again, for any n bunch of numbers we give you, you could say, well, but there could be some other numbers. Yes. The answer is emphatically yes. Could you measure something else? Yes, you can. You must. But we're giving you at least some idea of what is the relative thing that, you know. For example, notice that as you move down, the penalty of function call becomes, oh, so much less significant. The difference the between the list. this and this, I mean, there's, you know, the, uh, over here the difference is huge. Here, it's minor. It's probably, I mean, again, it's like if you're following a pointer, the other overhead of function call is probably just sort of absorbed right. in that latency. Right. right. So, yes. Deck. Deck. Thank you. Knuth, not me. <laughs> Why this? I, by the way, I started with pointing that. We have no idea. Again, somehow the compiler generates a different instruction sequence, which apparently is considerably faster. By the way, when we go to list, we are back to normal or <laughs> abnormal, whichever way. I mean, these are, again, it shows you that there is non-trivial interactions between data type, data structure, Compiler. And the compiler. And the architecture. Yes. Well, this is not actually, this probably you should be able to explain yourself. You, you need to apply just the logic manager's use. Optimize the common path. I mean, int 8, int 16, nobody cares. Intel management for many years since roughly 92 till about now basically cares about two data types, double for floating and in 32 for integers. Because they basically say most codes deal with that. Therefore, these are paths which are optimized. Optimized by the processor, optimized by the compiler. Observe that it's not that in 32 is fast. Very often, double is faster. Double is a very robust data type. It has been optimized. Management is looking at it. If there is some screw up with double, heads will roll. If there are some screw up with in 16, nobody would know. Right? The quality control or the bonuses or whatever you want. I mean, they do not. Run. Yes. If you screw up double, no bonus. If you screw up in s s 16, you're promoted. I mean, when you're trying to displace alpha. Why, think about why you're promoted. I wasn't joking. Yes, more importantly. Right. You force people to move to larger data type, right? which is good for Intel. They don't want, you know, puny programs. They want big data. And just even technically, I, in a I processor do. supporting four different types of integers, <coughs> you know, it's a mess. And nobody, again, no benchmarks measure in 16 performance. Nobody, it's not, it's not a place where anybody is watching. So it, there is no real conspiracy. Actually, no company. There is a conspiracy. All the conspiracy theories 
assume that there is some very clever guy on top who comes up with evil ideas. There are no clever guys on top. Therefore, they cannot come with either, you know, you know, Atelini. I mean, I, I don't think Atelini knows about, I mean, Atelini designed, but he ran into for many years, and he doesn't know in 16 from, you know, hole in the wall. Right? He's an accountant, was an accountant, he's an accountant, whatever. Now he's a multi-billionaire. But, uh, you know, he doesn't know, there is no conspiracy. But the, every organization adjusts itself to certain things. And there were these pressures, economic pressures, customer demands, you know, all kinds of things, which made double a good, well-implemented path. Right? Or in 32, it took them many years, by the way. If we, we used to have it, we removed it. We used to have a table entry for long double. This is a new, wider floating toy type. You wouldn't be. It's would we slow. Do it? uh, <laughs> it, we cannot. We are um, out yeah, we're already out of time. But it's easy enough to modify it to do long doubles. Right? Um, so we, we do recommend look at the code, run the benchmark, try to modify it. I find it utterly fascinating. And, you know, we could talk for about another 20 hours just on this table. There are so many mysteries. There are so many peculiar things. Again, what is the, the summary of this lecture? You know, guys, we're dealing with these fascinating things. People want to study mammals in the you know, ocean, you know, seals. We have something much more fascinating than that. And we are paid to study them. Their mating habits, their you know, compiler architecture, libraries, algorithms. This is remarkable stuff, okay? I typically try to explain, I mean, remember when you were young? I don't mean you're old like Paul and me, but when you were really young, when you were 16, you thought, oh, I'll go to MIT, I'll learn engineering, I'll do great things. You were excited, right? And then you got a job, you got a mortgage, and it all became boring. Guys, it is exciting, right? Sort of looking at this stuff is fascinating. They pay us for that. This, and I think it's, it's wonderful, you know. The reason I could still drag myself out of bed and come to work, that occasionally I could do that and I could talk to you guys about it because it's wonderful. Do I understand? No, but that's, Precisely the point. This is why, you know, why it's so, so fascinating. It's not the free cash flow, it's this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there are people who are fascinated, get their kicks out of maximizing free cash flow. But you are programmers, you shouldn't get those kicks. You shouldn't care. You should care about this. No, and I'm dead serious about it. What people do not understand, yes, we want Jeff to be fascinated with free cash flow. Sadly, he's not. But, uh, you know, he should be. That's his job. We want engineering managers to be fascinated by, you know, organizing programs together. But we don't want them to think about free cash flow, nor do we really want them, sorry guys, to think about this. You know, whatever you are, if you're a programmer, you should be fascinated by this. This is what you do. And, you know, I, you know, I want to just shake you up and say, guys, this is, this is wonderful. Look at it. And it's not about C++. It's about, you know, these mysteries of the universe. Huh? Or x86. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, it's not, if, if we were using MIPS, we would be seeing some, somewhat different numbers, but it still would be fascinating. I mean, you know, when I found myself in the middle of the compiler organization working with architecture guys, it was fascinating precisely because there were numbers which were utterly, be, uh, I'll tell you one of the next times the story of how I started my career there. Uh, but 
Now, sadly enough, we're going to have a break. And we might prolong the break for some other reasons. Uh, so as far as you're concerned, the next lecture is going to be two weeks